<clears throat> Hello? Does it work? It works. <laughs> it will work. They hear us now. Okay, so welcome okay. everybody. <laughs> okay. <laughs> welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the fifth SPR webinar that is organized by SPR Student Services and uh, we're very happy that you're all here. We're still expecting a few people but um, we're going to start anyway and um, I'm going to explain, uh, start by explaining a little bit um, about how this works for those people who are new and haven't attended any webinars before. So um, if you look at your control panel you can see that you have a couple of options and one of the options is to raise your hand. Um, if you click on raise my hand you can uh, actually um, we can see that you have a question and then um, during the discussion we can um, open up your microphone if you're using one and then you can actually ask the question in person yourself. So we will tell you, okay, suppose I say, Paula, Danino, you can, we open your microphone now and then you can actually talk to um, Dr. Lutz <clears throat> and ask your question. Uh, another option that you have is to ask questions and type them in. This is for people who don't have microphones and also um, if you have a question that's sort of to clarify or to one of the um, organizers, you can use that window and type in your question and we can see them and answer them. And um, so this is how you can communicate with us. Um, basically, the raising hand is best during the moments of discussion and the question window is best while there is talking and if you have like a small question or something like that. So that is um, how it works and um, if you have any questions you can type them in the window and, I, and if they're practical I will answer, answer them for you. <clears throat> so uh, I also would like to announce uh, the next webinar which is going to be um, November 27th and that's going to be Ken Le Levy and uh, he's going to do a webinar on career perspectives and uh, how to build up a good career as a researcher and therapist. Oh, November 22nd, I'm sorry, I'm corrected here, November 22nd and there's going to be an announcement of that uh, later on but note that and uh, in your calendars, yeah, already and so I'm going to give the floor now to uh, John Ogrodnichuk. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Kim. It's an honor and a pleasure to introduce Dr. Lutz. Uh, he's a full professor and head at, of uh, clinical psychology and psychotherapy at the University of Trier. Uh, many people uh, are aware of his internationally respected research program that investigates change in psychotherapy, which has a goal to support decision making and behavioral health based on empirical data. His current research and publication efforts involve the assessment and modeling of individual change for patients diagnosed with anxiety and depressive disorders, as well as the identification of predictors and mediators of treatment outcome, setting gains early in treatment and therapist differences. He's also developed a specific decision support tool for quality management in outpatient psychotherapy by the Techner Kraken Kassa, did I pronounce that correctly, uh, yes. in Germany. He also serves as the associate editor for psychotherapy research and consulting editor for the journal Clinical Psychology. His rise to prominence in our field was recognized by SBR as they bestowed him with their outstanding early career award in 2000. And uh, I'm looking very much forward to hearing his presentation this morning or evening, wherever you are, uh, on investigating change on a macro, meso, and micro level, a three-level research program in psychotherapy. I'll turn this over to you now, Wolfgang. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, John. Uh, and um, thank you very much, Kim, for organizing this, and Sam, and Sven, and of course, Louis, who was setting this up all. Uh, I would like to start, actually, on this talk on investigating change with a little uh, definition of uh, psychotherapy and it's called psychotherapy is an elephant. 
Uh, and you probably all know this this story about this wise man from Hindustan, and actually, but they're all blind and they want to describe an elephant. And you can also compare it as as researchers uh, want to describe the elephant psychotherapy. And depending on the perspective, they call it a spear, the elephant, a snake, or a tree, or the wall, or a fan. And in some way, at the end of the stories, uh, they all tried, and they, though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. And in some way, I would like to give you some perspectives on change within psychotherapy, within psychological um, investigations. Um, uh, to uh, uh, clarify or to give you uh, new ideas or some ideas on uh, how research on, psych on change in psychotherapy can be conducted. And I would like to start with some additional perspectives on psychotherapy. This is a very old quote which was getting famous, was later on uh, kind of cynically used by Eisen to criticize psychotherapy research. And it's called psychotherapy is an undefined technique apply to unspecified problems with unpredictable outcome. For this technique, we recommend rigorous training. And this is in some way funny because uh, uh, it was somebody said this during the Boulder Conference in the 50s. But if you, t and everybody knows right today that this is a little strange, strange expression. But if you turn it around, call it, uh, it somehow describes actually what psychotherapy is doing uh, or psychotherapy research is doing. We try to define our techniques. Uh, we are using process research manuals to define exactly what the techniques are. Uh, we try to specify the problems. Uh, we're using psychometric measures. We're using diagnostic systems. Uh, and we try somehow to predict the outcome. And, uh, uh, and we have to stand, if we want to be a science, we have to manage uh, to hold on this topic to predict the outcome. And I will talk on this later too. And all this endeavor. Uh, at all, it helps us somehow to say that take rigorous training is justified. Otherwise, we couldn't uh, justify uh, um, rigorous training or our training programs. So there's another citation from uh, Maurice Parlov, uh, another famous figure uh, from psychotherapy, SPR, psychotherapy research. And he says, no form of therapy has ever been initiated without the claim that it had unique therapeutic advantages and no form of therapy has ever been abandoned because of its failure to live up to these claims. Uh, that's another perspective and a nice view. And I would continue, I would like to continue with this side from uh, Marvin Goldfried. Uh, I, we use it also as a, as a guideline in some ways for, for the uh, new textbook we published recently uh, on psychotherapy in German. Uh, clearly, we need to rewrite our textbooks on psychotherapy in picking up the textbook of the future, we should see in the table of contents on the listing of school A, school B, and so on, but an outline of the various agreed upon intervention principles, a specification of rank techniques for implementing each principle, and an indication of the relative effectiveness of each of these techniques. And I would like to go on with the citation from Klaus Grabe, who's also president uh, of SPR. And he had lots of influence in uh, that in the licensure that we got a licensure procedure with both psych clinical psychologists within Germany. Uh, change in the service system of psychotherapy is possible by switching the focus from an orientation on treatment approaches to an orientation on patients and outcome. The implementation of routine outcomes management and feedback into routine care. The implementation of a differential indication phase before treatment as well as a disorder-specific orientation, but at the same time based on a broad understanding of common principles or factors of therapy. And uh, I would also add uh, for the intro phase or for this beginning a citation from Malcolm Gladwell, who isn't a psychotherapy researcher or psychotherapist, but I like to, uh, I like this citation very much because it somehow uh, fits very well to psychotherapy as a treatment, but as the position of psychotherapy in a lifetime. We need to prepare ourselves for the possibility that sometimes big changes follow from small events, and that sometimes these changes can happen very quickly. And in some way, psychotherapy is a small event in a life, and, and it, it tries to change things uh, very quickly, 
and also if there are small things within therapy, I will later talk about sudden gains or sudden losses who can, uh, or both, uh, who can have an impact, uh, a, a small event which has a huge impact. Uh, and I would finish, like to finish this with a quotation from Irene Elkin and this perspective after having done many studies, all of you know her, uh, uh, she was the principal investigator of the uh, NIMH depression collaborative study and after many um, papers and research on, the, uh, research on this uh, project, she came to this conclusion in considering all of these points, we have to come to the conclusion that we will probably learn more about the presence of therapist effects and be better able to demonstrate the significance of these effects by carrying out studies of large databases collected, for example, in the context of managed care or other large practice networks. In these settings, there would be access to large numbers of therapists and relatively large numbers of patients per therapist. And let's come back from those citations to psychotherapy. It's now I want to show you this old table. Actually, I borrowed it from Ken Howard. Uh, which shows the effectiveness of psychotherapy. We know psychotherapy is an effective treatment uh, and there are thousands of studies behind that. And 73% of the treated patients are better off than uh, those in the control group. And it's, uh, as a treatment, is better than many uh, physical interventions. Uh, um, but on the other side, we have also space for improvement. So we are not at, a, at, a, at the end of the development. So uh, there are still about 27% uh, where we can add uh, better investigate, better, better um, treatments and to implement new developments. And that shows you the negative side. We have from a summer report from Mike Lambert, uh, Ogles or more uh, reports, we know that about 5 to 10% of patients show deterioration and 15 to 25% no reliable change through treatment. That all depends, of course, on the studies you look at and the outcome measures you're using. And so in some way, we're still at a stage where you have to, to look at places and spots to improve uh, our research and our service system. So all this brought me somehow when I uh, moved on. I was at uh, several places over the years. I uh, started in, in, in Stuttgart in a research center. I was then a postdoc with Ken Howard at Northwestern University and later on uh, did my habilitation at the University of Bern. And when I came to Trier, got like a, a full professorship here and uh, I started a research, I started to, to get a research group together and uh, we have uh, the investigating change uh, in psych through psychotherapy. And I can, you can summarize the whole program in when, how and why do people change through psychological interventions or human change through psychotherapy uh, program. Uh, and this is, covers basically all the research topics we do in this clinical psychology and psychotherapy section at the University of Trier. And we cover uh, research and I want to talk about this uh, from three levels of uh, investigation, like a macro level, there we look at patient or client focused psychotherapy research, the prediction of change, therapist effects, feedback, um, and that's a traditional services research perspective. And then we go on to the mesal level, and then we look from on the macro level, we have more going uh, through on a huge databases and having more a linear perspective on change. Where on the mesal level, we look also on discontinuous treatment causes sudden gains and sudden losses, underlying processes and factors, also looking on, on a videotape basis uh, on reasons for change and also for discontinuous cha change. And, and the third level, the micro level, uh, we, we look at therapeutic micro strategies and uh, I hope we will come to that uh, at the end um, and that we talk more in detail on this uh, too. And we have just investigated like a reframing or uh, reframing strategy like a short as a, a short therapeutic investigation, one hour assessment, one hour um, uh, training, and to see if that has an impact also on an EEG level. So just looking for a small bit of change and to assess this change uh, through this uh, small treatment. Uh, um, and all this is happening 
within our outpatient center for psychotherapy and clinical training program and it's also a PhD program, psychotherapy research connected to it and students can already start uh, in the master program uh, when they focus on clinical psychology, they can have relatively early focus on psychotherapy research and uh, research uh, methods training uh, connected to this. Uh, let's uh, show you, that's a, a, a few of we had our, our, of our last day off of the whole group and uh, so many like the clinicians also part of it and here the research assistants, the research team as well as the research assistants, by now it's a pretty, pretty large uh, research team. And uh, uh, here's, this shows our new uh, building. So I'll give you first a little bit uh, the uh, information on the setup we have here in Trier um, before I start actually to talk about the different projects and perspectives. So actually we will move in fall or in spring or in this building. Not, we don't have the full building, we have just, just uh, one and a half stores uh, of this. So and that shows you a little bit the surrounding uh, Trier's uh, I know Bill Stahl showed uh, beautiful pictures from the beach where he was at the at the lodge at that time. Uh, so I thought I I plug some pictures in from Trier from this surrounding. That's a few you have from this new building. Uh, it's located in the vineyards. Trier is the oldest city of Germany, and it's the oldest uh, wine uh, uh, wine area too. And you see here one of our treatment rooms, which is uh, um, uh, just gives you idea how they look and you also see uh, here we have little cameras two actually in each treatment room so we videotape each session uh, so we have by now uh, thousands of videotapes of sessions uh, for further analysis on the mesal level. Uh, here we come uh, to uh, uh, that's a setup within uh, one of those rooms we have a touch screen data entry so patients do data entry before a session and after the session and you see that's here uh, so once uh, patients come in they can sit in front of this data entry system and they get uh, we have an immediate feedback after the treatment uh, of the results they're seeing here that the cause of treatment but also if there would be si something like suicidal ideation uh, patients would see that uh, directly uh, immediately or therapists would do that uh, immediately before the session actually starts already. Uh, and this is here the setup for the video. Um, uh, I mean it's usually closed then when the treatment is happening but then that's something how it looks. You have the patient and the therapist and we also have, if you do supervision you have all this information also. And that's basically uh, like the screen I have it on my on my computer then I have like uh, uh, I can see when I have, I mean, I do supervision with, with the students. I see, uh, can look into the session, have the therapist and the, the patient. And I have here status information, for example, on suicidality, medication, the brief symptom inventory, uh, how serious the problems are in different areas, what the, the level of impairment is, uh, the cause of treatment here uh, for later on. This is a short version of the SCL11, so it shows just an example case over the course of treatment. And we have also large assessments, here the OQ30, short version of the OQ45, uh, and the IIP, the interpersonal problems, a short version. Each five sessions we have additional larger assessments. Um, so that's all basically uh, somehow uh, the backup uh, of the whole research procedure. So now I, I actually come to the first poll. Uh, do you want me to uh, show more pictures or I, should I start now uh, with, the, with the research? Um, actually, is it, uh, how do I see or hear anything from the audience, Kim? Is that, no, I don't see them, but I, I don't hear them either, right? You do a call uh, now. Wolfgang, I uh, actually yeah. I can, hi, Hello? can you hear me? Yes, now I hear you. Okay, so um, people can vote right now, and okay. they can vote. Uh, let me check how many people have voted. Um, so there's 84 percent people of the people who are there have voted, and let me wait for a little bit. So people 
please vote. <laughs> I and actually, I, I, would like, I would prefer to start with the research now, actually, yeah. Yeah, that's actually what the people say. And let me show you that 61% of people would like to start with the research. Ah, okay. Can you see the, can you see the results? No, where do I see this? No, you can't see it probably, but uh, ah. the viewers can actually. Ah, okay. All right, so go on with the research then. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so just uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we also have meetings. I have just two more pictures actually, uh, and there here you see Kim and Sam and Craig. So we had a pre-SPR meeting, so once in a while. Uh, Andrew, I, I I know he's in the audience too. I think. Uh, so and um, I will continue now with the mentors. Uh, this is all somehow in the context. Uh, this whole research program. Uh, program and I have see Ken Howard. I did my postdoc there and with Klaus Krabe, University of Bern. Actually, I did my um, habilitation phase. Um, but I could also mention, though they were the most important mentors uh, for this research program. And if you look closely, uh, you see uh, you see connections to to their research uh, within their program. But I could also mention Michael Lambert, of course, uh, in recent years, Michael Barker, Mert Krauss, Hans Cordy, Bill Kinsoff, Bill Stiles, David Olinsky, and Irene Elkin, and certainly many, many more. And uh, now I would show you, like to really start with the, with the research part. And uh, uh, I would like to start with the, uh, what, what is it, individual patient change and patient-focused research, what are we looking here? Uh, what does it actually mean? That would be my first topic. And then I will talk a little bit about nearest neighbors, disaggregation, how to improve those uh, models. And, and then I would like to go to the macro level on new projects and applications, how to extend it. I will talk uh, on the uh, quality assurance project, the feedback project, the TT uh, study uh, done with the German health insurance uh, um, uh, organization, which we just finished. And then I will move on to the mesal level, shapes of change and sudden gains and losses, and uh, on the micro level and micro interventions. I hope we'll come to that uh, 5.52, and then we can come on with the discussion. Uh, I have also some breaks in between, though, so there will be time also for questions. Um, I would like to start with those three questions about treatments, interventions, and psychotherapy. Uh, um, and this goes also back uh, to Ken Howard, um, this uh, differentiation in does uh, our treatment work under experimental conditions, that's the traditional efficacy question, does this new intervention produce better outcomes than does an already commonly used intervention or than a control intervention, does it work in practice, uh, does this new treatment work in practice, that's our traditional effectiveness question. And then we come to the patient-focused question, and I introduced uh, before the effects of treatment, how, how good psychotherapy is, but that there's still much, or that there's still space for improvement. And uh, that is it, is it working for this patient? That's actually the clinician's perspective. Is this patient's condition responding to the treatment that's being applied right now? And uh, whereas efficacy research and effectiveness research, there are large studies which have which are finished at some point and take a long time until they uh, come into the, into the practice. So patient-focused research has this goal actually to give immediate feedback uh, to the practitioner and to support clinical practice during basically during the uh, course of treatment um, and to improve treatment. And there's uh, here a few points which are important on this perspective on patient-focused or client-focused research. Um, particularly the focus on patient's response to the treatment provided. Uh, we focus on the scientist-practitioner gap. Uh, I explained this just, uh, um, um, just before, that there's the immediate feedback, uh, and that's not this long loop before uh, a study has been published and before it, it comes into practice in some of give immediate feedback or there's immediate loop connection between science and practice. Uh, at least that's the goal with this. Um, uh, endeavor. And the decision support tools for the treatment of individual cases are necessary and helpful uh, to support 
and positive as well as negative treatment causes are on the focus. Uh, of course, we look also on the negative ones, give feedback on those, and uh, that's especially where feedback shows the research from Michael Amber that come later back to this, uh, has the most uh, impact. Uh, therapist effects on issue expected treatment response, and uh, which means prediction of uh, progress and adaptive decision making during the course of treatment. Um, and of course, there's a inter large amount of international corporations going on. And you will see uh, during my talk that I will talk about studies and data sets from several countries. So it's not limited that this kind of research is done in one, one country. It's done in several countries. And, and the uh, researchers are actually cooperating uh, within that field and using, uh, um, doing the analysis uh, on different data sets in different countries, which actually gives an additional perspective to this whole to psychotherapy, because psychotherapy is somehow very differently organized uh, in different countries. So I will go back to this original study we did on expected treatment response that was at my time uh, when I worked together with Ken Howard at Northwestern University doing my postdoc there. And we started all this and we used these seven predictors basically, current well-being, current symptoms, current life functioning, psychotherapy in the past, or previous therapy, duration of, of the problem, chronicity basically, and positive treatment expectation, and global assessment of functioning uh, to forecast individual causes of treatment using a data set of about a thousand patients uh, and using growth, uh, growth curve analysis to do those individual predictions. And basically what you see here is that uh, the, this line is the observed cause from a patient, so this two patients both having a depressive disorder, and this patient was 12 sessions in treatment that won 22 sessions, and you see an immediate or early improvement here comes to, this is the normal range, so that's the cutoff to the normal range here, and that would be the predicted cause of treatment based on those initial uh, uh, information we had of that patient. So we had those lines basically before the treatment, and you can use the, the observe, then you can use this plot basically to compare the observed course of treatment with the expected course of treatment. And that's the failure boundary based on the measurement error uh, of the whole model. And of course, it's such a prediction can't be perfect, and things change over the course of treatment. And you see here, of, again, uh, we talk about this later. This is the failure boundary. And we have uh, uh, here a cause that's a very positive development. It's mental health index, higher scores show better health, better mental health. And you see here that this patient isn't uh, um, improving too well, actually, isn't, isn't the whole cause of treatment is, is not going too good. So it's first it's the patient improves a bit, then it goes down, he or she comes back. But then latest here, that would be basically sign we have maybe to rethink the treatment strategy, go into supervision, or to, to rethink what, what should be done. And so that, that brought us to this analysis, what happens if people, or this idea, to look at those clients, what happens if they fall in a specific range during the course of treatment, if they fall below this failure boundary. And as you can see here, uh, this patient is falling uh, between session two and eight at least once below that boundary. And this shows you here uh, the results of that analysis. So what happens if p patients fall be between session two and eight beyond that failure boundary? What happens in terms of uh, outcome? And if in that sample, if the patient didn't fall at all below, below then the success rate was uh, 65%. And if it is one time, uh, the patient falls one time between session two and eight below this failure boundary, it's about 0.48. Uh, and if it's two or three times below that boundary, it's 0.36. So actually it goes down. So if the, again, if the patient falls below two and eight below this boundary, and so, but it doesn't go to zero. So it's still, and though that we have to keep in mind when we talk about all this later, all these are just probabilities. It gives some information, but it doesn't give the truth. So we always need an additional clinical decision, since even in that case, 
even still 36% of the patients, they come back, they improve. So it, the probability is less good than for those, but it's still 36%. But at least at that point, it should be some uh, some indication that, that somebody, something or that we sh should rethink about that case. Uh, okay, but that's... Uh, and if you have this kind of data sets, this kind of information, like 1,200 cases, you have also this possibility to study therapist effects, for example. Uh, we did recently a study where we showed that there's uh, the whole analysis of therapist effects uh, depends a lot on the methods used within that arena and what kind of data sets you have, uh, the, the, time, the measurements over time you have, and so on. But within that study, you see they actually exist. There are therapist effects, 1,200 uh, cases within that case, and each therapist had at least 20 cases within that sample. And you see here the, the 10 best therapists and the 10 worst therapists. Uh, and then there is actually a difference between those therapists. And the, the 10 best do about four times better than the 10 uh, less good ones within that sample. And here again, if you look closer to this, explore more the therapist's caseload, maybe using this also for continuous education or for even for training uh, to use. And here you see different patient symptom clusters. This is a cluster A. Uh, they are not uh, very much disturbed. That's so in between disturbance. So they, there are some difference. So they are more interpersonal disturbed, not only symptomly disturbed. And they're very heavily disturbed. And you see the caseload of two therapists. Therapist 1 with 15 patients and therapist 2 with 19 patients. And you look closer to this cluster C. This therapist 1 had six patients in cluster C. Uh, one was expected to improve, but five actually were observed uh, or actually did improve. And the average uh, observed minus expected slope was positive. Uh, and whereas the therapist 2 had 11 cases within that uh, impairment cluster and five uh, were expected to improve, four were observed, and the actual rate was negative. So this is basically still you have not many cases per therapist, so you can't look at, con at significance or things like that. But you can get at least an idea, basically, what, what, what are the areas where their further, further training might be helpful and what patients you didn't have so far, uh, what else you could uh, uh, what you can look at for to improve your therapeutic skills. Um, so now I come, that were the original work with this, uh, see this paper was published, Sean Martinovich, Ken Hauer, and Scott Leon in 2002. So that was the original work based on this. And when I moved on coming uh, to Bern, actually, uh, in Switzerland, I, I picked up a little bit this analogy uh, from, uh, um, to improve those models, some analogy from uh, the avalanche research in uh, Switzerland, that's how they predict avalanches. It's, it's somehow an analogy. Uh, it's not, we, we don't use it the same way than they do, especially because we have completely different uh, uh, predictors, of course. We're not so much interested in snow depth or, high the, or how, how high the snow is or how much new snow was in the last 24 hours. Those are the predictors of, uh, uh, for those avalanches. And, but the idea is, is, is very interesting. You have a mountain, and you have a huge amount of information of past days with that mountain. How many avalanches have been under what side kind of circumstances? So you have the snow, snow depth, the, how much new snow is, the temperature, the change in temperature from the last night to today. And so once a new day comes along, you select the closest days of that, of that coming day. And, uh, and you look, if at that closest days, there have been an avalanche. And if that's how this works, in, that's the Bernice, Bernice Oberland. It's a very famous ski resort in Switzerland. And you see, uh, from the 10 closest days, uh, seven had an avalanche on that specific time. This is uh, just from sometime in February 2010. Uh, you see that seven had, and then in this area, there's some danger for avalanches, whereas in there only five of those ten closest days had avalanches. So it's not such a high danger, but it's still there. 
and it's uh, less here and no, no problems around here with an avalanche. So we try to use this analogy and those methods actually to, to predict uh, the cause of treatment, to select the closest ones. So basically using this idea, if a patient comes into treatment and you search, of course, with different variables, how, uh, how much symptoms patients have, what the interpersonal problems are, what the diagnosis are, you search for the closest already treated patients you have in your database and you try to use this information somehow to, to guide your, your future treatment, uh, your upcoming treatment. That's the, the main idea. It's actually not so different to like cluster analysis or latent cluster analysis. The only, where well, you have like a cluster and you, you put the patient within that cluster. The only difference here is you, you put the patient into the middle. You search around that patient for the closest ones. That's actually the main idea. Uh, and so we did this study uh, in, uh, in 2006 uh, using two data sets of homogeneous subsamples uh, or using those two data sets from the outpatient clinic at the University of Bern, which has more integrative cognitive behavioral and interpersonal focus. And we had also data from the outpatient clinic at the University of Bochum in Germany, and uh, which has a cognitive behavioral focus. So we basically this idea using two homogeneous subsamples of the 30 nearest patients uh, based on those different treatment approaches and do like two predictions. Uh, just a new case comes along and you do a prediction based on the data of the integrative treatment and a prediction based on the, uh, on the CBT treatment. And basically here this shows you again this basic idea. You have a case uh, that's like the target patient comes new into treatment and you search for the, those uh, the others already treated patients and you search for those already treated ones and you use this information of the closest ones uh, to do further predictions and you basically do this with the other treatment too so you have two predictions uh, based on different data sets uh, and uh, of two different treatments and they can be the same on average, the effectiveness can be the same on average, but there's like an individual focus uh, prediction model. And you see this here with that only two variables. You see here an example with three variables. And of course, it gets more and more tricky. Uh, you need large databases if you want to really do this, not without any uh, estimations, just to use the available data, uh, because if you have more than three variables, uh, you, it, it turns out it gets less and less closest patients which are overlapping between all those variables. And you here see a part of this study, there was no uh, average difference in slopes between those treatment approaches, the integrative one and the CBT one. But we selected then those where actually the, where we found differential predictions based on that model, where those we were actually really different, so based on the closest ones. So, and they had to have uh, had to have at least a reliable change difference after 10 sessions. And again, here's, this shows you a little bit the method, how this works. You have a target case and you select close, based on the data sets you have, the closest ones. And if you use several, several variables, you use the overlapping ones. And we actually try different kind of techniques to define closest and we will do uh, work on this in the future. With, uh, to continue. And this is an example here and of an integrative therapy uh, patient treated uh, with diagnosis of anxiety and depression. And here we have the observed course of treatment and that's the expected course of treatment based on the CBT group and there was, you see this difference and then there's the expected uh, uh, course of treatment for the integrative therapy and, and you see uh, though you have this differential predictions the patient was treated with integrative therapy. And then also we have treated with CBT. In that case, the prediction diagnosis of anxiety and depression, or we have uh, a better prediction for the um, uh, uh, CBT uh, condition. And actually that's, even so both were on average the same, but we found differential predictions for about, depending on the data sets, between 25% and 30% uh, of, of patients. And, uh, and we also did adapt this over the course of treatment here 
uh, as you can see, you're using also the an, an adaptive uh, model or prediction of the course of treatment using also the information which was going on in the first three sessions. Uh, this was done with the uh, uh, Wakefield data set from the UK from Michael Borkham and Chris Leach and Mike Hooker. And so also the nice thing within this kind of idea basically is you have those closest ones. If you have a case, you have the closest 30 already treated ones, integrative therapy with CBT. You can also have how much variation you have in those cases uh, or you can also define just reliable change. You don't have to need the slopes or hierarchical linear modeling for those just to define the close, uh, just to define the reliable change ones. Or you have information on the diagnosis and if they are different. And you also have information somehow if you're using in the, the idea basically in a clinical setup in an outpatient center, you have the idea how many uh, of those patients have been treated by a specific therapist who might have lots of experience with those, uh, with those kinds of patients and might be a perfect supervisor for this uh, new upcoming patient. Okay, and uh, then we moved on. We did several ways of uh, validation studies. Let's just show you one example uh, which catches on this idea basically on decision rules and outcome uh, between session two and eight, what happens then later on in treatment. And if you use this kind of method and uh, you define you not only one failure boundary but several failure boundaries from 67 percent say confidence bound to 99.5 percent confidence bound around in the positive as well as in the negative direction. And then you can say what happens if somebody falls between session two and eight between those boundaries or above these boundaries, what does this mean in terms of probability for outcome or for successful treatment? And as you see, if somebody falls between that time three times above that here, that three times above the uh, uh, 67 uh, percentile uh, uh, or the even the uh, 95 percentile, then you come comes up to about 90 percent of success rate later on between session 17 and 28. So that's very early when this early change happened uh, between session 2 and 8. Uh, so those patients have been high, very high chance to be successful. Whereas on the other side, if they have three uh, times crossed that border in the negative direction uh, and it's an extreme, like the, again the 95 percentile, they have a 85 percent probability of not succeeding within that treatment. Um, so that's, um, uh, um, so that should get at least a hint or an idea. So to rethink this, still 25 percent will improve, but, uh, or 15 percent, it doesn't really matter. So still there's some percentage which, so in, you have a decision to make on the individual case and it's a clinical decision. But uh, it's, it's a high percentage, so it makes sense to rethink the treatment strategy uh, and to, to, to take supervision or, to, or intervision to talk, talk with colleagues about that case. Uh, I wonder if now might be a good time to take a, a, a pause and see if there are any questions. Yeah, I, I actually have two more slides okay. I, and then I have a natural pause here. But okay. I just want to show a few, uh, a few ideas. We will just continue with that idea and then I will finish with, a, with, that, with that part uh, anyway. So it's just, uh, 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 we will continue with this, having differential rates, different predictions for each group. Uh, so you can also, if you have those closest ones, you can have a prediction on improvement versus deterioration for those, based on those. I would like to include also early response or also nonlinear modelings of those uh, change procedures and also would like to use uh, uh, just question or just to, to define uh, the, the outcome basically on those areas where the actual problems are. So far we just used overall scores uh, to define this and then if there's somebody who doesn't have a problem within that scale, also define closeness in terms of uh, the ratings within the items. And now, so I, I stop here and so we take some questions here, yeah. Are there any questions so far? Kim, do we know if there are any questions that people have posed yet? 
<clears throat> there are now there are no raised hands, but it usually takes a little bit of time for people to uh, raise their hands and ask a question. So if anyone has a question for Dr. Lutz, um, please raise your hand and we can unmute you then. Well, it seems to make perfect sense so far then. <laughs> yes. Is uh, am I too fast? I mean, it's uh, you don't have any feedback or control on, uh, uh, on within the system. Is that said? Oh, Is I see. That, I, we have a question. Somebody, yeah. Still somebody. We have a question. <laughs> we have a question. Do you know this? Is still somebody in the room? Yes, there are people in the room. <laughs> And Wolfgang, we actually do have a question. Oh, okay. Um, this is uh, Sherwood Waldron, and I'm going to unmute that person right now. Go ahead, Sherwood. Hello. It's a very interesting Hello. meeting. I, I wonder how you control for the, for the question of um, what happens over the course of subsequent time, because these are all rather short-term uh, treatments, and I'm a psychoanalyst, and I mostly work with people longer term. Yes, that's, that's the area where I have a, a, a question. Uh, I mean, you're right. I mean, we use those uh, mostly for uh, like uh, t between 25 and 40 sessions, or and sometimes shorter, depending on the data set. Uh, but some of those patients are longer in treatment too. Uh, but you're right that. Uh, those models so far have been only developed for those uh, uh, kind of patients. We don't have, I will, when I talk, continue now, I will talk about this uh, insurance company study. We did also, uh, we did also collect data on psychoanalysis patients uh, with up to 300 sessions, but we don't have too many actually yet to, to adapt those models uh, for these kind of treatments. So, so uh, but when we, we collect data on this, we will, might be uh, able to do it at some point. Is that, is that somehow, I mean, is that what, what, what the question were you want? Yes. yes, yes indeed, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And Wolfgang, there's also a question by Omar Gelo, yes. which I'm, who I'm going to unmute right now. Um, Omar, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sure. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I, I didn't understand right very well how do you get those prediction curves. The, the predict, say it again, please. Prediction, uh, how, the yeah, closest how you get the curve. Yes, yes. Well, we, we, we use different technologies, basically. We use Euclidean distances, which is in some way just uh, a pre, um, uh, some algorithm used also in cluster analysis, but we played around also with them. Um, Overlap. I, I showed you this shortly within that Venn diagram, where we just use overlap between several um, variables and use so. So patients had to have a score, say for example in the BSI, and uh, and then they use the 25% of closest ones. Say it's 1.2, and then you use all those closest ones within the BSI from say 1.3 to 1.1. And, and then you look, look in those cases, if they have an IIP score, for example, uh, those having also similar IIP score to that patient. And then you move on for the uh, global assessment of functioning, for example. So that's how it's selected. So they have to have a similar, a similar assessment over several uh, variables uh, to, be, to be part of this closest group. But there are several ways, actually, how to define this, and we, we're still working on on testing different algorithms and, and models for, in, in order to do that. Yeah. Okay, so actually, actually the way you get, uh, because my, the point was about the, 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 the lower border, for example. Actually, you, you, you derive it empirically based on the sample you're analyzing. Yes, yes, yes. Right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Omar. We have another question from um, Sarah Austin. Um, Sarah, you can go ahead now. Hi. Um, I'm just curious, how many outcome measures are you usually using um, to determine um, the, the nearest neighbor? 
uh, well, I mean, the uh, the outcome measure we have done studies using the the BSI. Uh, there are also well-being measure. I used the Compass system uh, quite often. I used also the OQ45 um, and the Core, of course, Core measure. Um, uh, so I have used basically very different uh, outcome measures. The BHQ, we'll talk later on that one too. So it's very different outcome measures uh, we, we, we tried uh, with these models. And, uh, but depending on the data set, we use different predictors. But those most stable predictors we used actually were those seven uh, already in this initial, in the initial paper used, like chronicity, previous treatment, uh, the, the, um, some kind of impairment score, functioning score, um, and the general assessment of functioning from the therapist perspective. Treatment expectation, so those. Thank you. Okay, maybe if there aren't any other questions, uh, we could uh, keep moving along. Okay, I come to this uh, this uh, feedback study we did in the uh, German uh, system uh, on outpatient psychotherapy. So I, I will give a, a short intro in uh, basically how this is, works in, in Germany. Outpatient psychotherapy is paid by health insurance system and depending on therapeutic methods, more or less sessions are approved. So, and in order to get an approval for doing therapy, they have to write a psychological proposal, like an expertise, and this gets evaluated by supervisors, and then the same procedure is happening if you want a continuation after 25 sessions. So, like CBT, you can have come up to 45, continue 60 or 80, psychodynamic, or that's a special version of psychodynamic treatment in, in Germany, 50, 80, 100, or psychoanalysis, 160, 240, or 300. And independent evaluators decide about that continuation based on that psychological proposal or expertise. And within that quality assurance project we did in the last almost 10 years, so we tried to do, to support this proposal by psychometric measurements, and uh, no approval process is needed when psychometric measurements indicate psychotherapy at the beginning. So then patients could immediately start with their therapist. And uh, just, just a short uh, reminder on work from Mike Lambert on feedback and decision rules. And uh, again, so that's, uh, that's relevant here. Feedback helps reduce treatment failures. Those developing not very well, we have an, uh, an average effect size from 0.4 to 0.7. Uh, um, and feedback is also helpful for patients not at risk for treatment. And the effect size is between, um, uh, but that we, that we don't know too well actually. It's on an average less than, uh, um, uh, or we don't know, it's, it's less than um, uh, the one for uh, treatment failure. Is that true? We have only 15 minutes left. Uh, Time for, is that 15 minutes? Oh, okay. Oh, wow. Uh, so, um, with the negative prediction providing feedback results in more sessions for patients with positive predictions and the therapy duration decreases so we have less sessions. Uh, so, let's go for this TK project. I will then shortly cover this project. Uh, i just show you then a few slides on this. So we have a feedback, therapists got feedback on this project. Uh, and you see uh, that's like the status feedback and then if there wasn't any of those measures within uh, the clinical relevant range, though they still had to do the proposal. And if there was in one of those measures, so BSI and the interpersonal problem uh, score or the BDI, uh, then we would, uh, then they could just start with treatment. And for the course of treatment, the therapists got also feedback over the course of treatment uh, based on this kind of graph, for example. Uh, and there, there's a full report on the whole study. I don't want to go into details on this. And we have like an intervention group and a control group. And then we have several other control groups, partially very large. Uh, but we have only measurements on those two 1,060 cases in the intervention group with feedback and the control group having only pre and post data assessments. I don't want to go into the uh, details, but what you show here, what I can show you here is that we have patients uh, uh, um, 
that's within that study they really disturb in comparison to the non-clinical sample and to other outpatient samples. So actually treatment uh, uh, in Germany is happening on in the indeed disturbed patients uh, that you can say and if you use, I haven't said this, in the intervention group we also use uh, some additional diagnostic system and if you do that except to like a record just, just to get an impression of the patient and then you do the diagnosis. Uh, so we had about 48 uh, percent having a second diagnosis. So it looks like that therapy is looking closer to the patients if you have like another, uh, if you have like a more structured diagnosis uh, than just having diagnosis uh, without any uh, structured interview. And this uh, is an interesting graph. I compared basically uh, uh, this is box plots of different BSI pre symptom inventory uh, measures pre and post. And as you can see, uh, within that's the TP study, and we have a follow-up of one year, and of those 1,570 cases, uh, and that's the average uh, outpatient uh, group, 1.14, and that's where they basically all start. We have a comparison, an outpatient center in Bochum with 1,500 cases in Bern, in Trier, that's our outpatient vendor with uh, almost 1,200 cases, overall 5,750 and those are the, that's the NIMH study with 245 cases. And that's about the right, except for the NIMH, they are, they are more disturbed, they are selected. But at the end, they, uh, oops, it should be a little bit more down here, but at the end, uh, it seems so they all end somehow similar, uh, which is interesting. So we would have here a higher uh, effect size, of course, but at the end, the status they reach, the patients, it's very similar and that's for all patients and that's also comparable to that cutoff point where we would say that's the normal for the normal population the mean and one cent deviation of that mean uh, so below that that's the area where actually the uh, normal uh, or if you just uh, if you have a norm sample a reference sample and that's where they end it's actually very comparable in some way and also if you just don't use all available ones pre post you see you have a lot of data missing if you just use those where we have pre and post. So 2,860 had pre and post. Uh, and you get basically a very similar picture that the NIMH study, which is a randomized controlled trial. Uh, and then we have here the, um, uh, uh, the, the results and the follow-up studies, which is pretty stable, all one-year follow-ups, and they are pretty stable here. Wolfgang, uh, do you have a moment for a brief question? So I, I would think I would think I would, might stop here. I said I still have uh, a few slides left, but uh, uh, I can, or maybe I jump then ahead. Yeah, we, we make a stop here for questions. Yes. Okay. Kim, uh, you had a question. Uh... Um, yes, um, Omar, I have unmuted you. You can ask your question. Yeah. Go ahead, Omar. Uh, no, no, yes, no, no. I, I, I just, I wanted to. I didn't want to ask anything. Maybe it's still the, my request for the previous question. Okay, so, I'm sorry. Okay, no, it's okay. All right. Go on then, Wolfgang. Sorry. Right. Oh, we yeah. have, a, we have a question from Katrin Murtel. Yes. Katrin, go ahead. Um, thank you, Kim. Um, I find that very interesting, Wolfgang, what you're doing, especially with the cluster analyses of the closest neighbors. Yes. About your last uh, sheet that you showed, uh, could you go back maybe to the to the big results? Uh, of the, uh, yes, exactly. I was wondering, you know, if you if you look at mean values and then have so huge samples, what is lost in that information? Because if I look, for example, at the Bochum study, the post values, yes. there's a lot of extreme values to the right. Yes. So I wonder yes. what the mean value really tells us. Like the NIMH yeah. looks very selected. And very yes, good. yes. I mean, that's, uh, I actually spent uh, the last two weeks uh, with Julian Rubel, basically we did work on this. I mean, this rep mm -hmm. represent, this, this represents a huge, a huge sample and huge studies. I mean, there's millions of research money was going in this, and this gives you a nice overview in terms of what the effect actually of treatment is. But it also shows you what I said at the beginning. It doesn't work for everybody, right? You see this here. 
for this follow-up study. We have this move. We have on average. And so that's basically in some way we could discuss for a long time on just those slides. But uh, in some way that's the justification basically to do this kind of feedback and to do improvement, uh, to do uh, feedback studies and to, 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 to try to, to get to bridge this uh, scientist practitioner gap in some way, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is an amazing study. Like, there's so much uh, work and money going into there. Do you plan to uh, to investigate on subsamples, like maybe looking at more um, yeah, we, homogeneous yes. samples? Sure. Yeah, sure. yeah, that's it. sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I'm uh, yeah. This is, for example, showing you what therapists do with the feedback. So, in 70 percent, uh, therapists actually do something with feedback. Um, it shows you that. Uh, for example, those getting showing a negative developing at the beginning and then no change or good progress. And as you see, the discussion, if they had no change or deterioration at that uh, feedback point, they, show, they discussed the answers with the questionnaire. Uh, and uh, we did here try to adjust therapeutic interventions uh, or we try to work on the therapeutic alliance, uh, whereas with uh, interesting uh, a good progress here, but I wasn't prepared to end of therapy, but I wasn't significant the difference here. So I will, uh, patients really like this. Uh, I like the idea of having a project to monitor the quality of outpatient. That's about 92% uh, really like this. Uh, and let me see, I will show you maybe, but they liked it more than the, than the uh, clinicians. So that's the patients. So they were more completely satisfied or very satisfied. The clinicians not too much, and those independent reviewers, they didn't like it too much. And uh, so, and we of course will continue looking to those patterns of early change, like uh, to show to uh, with, with different samples where we have like repeated measurements, like for this def defining early responders, or like uh, and, um, and, um, the ups and downs of treatment within those crew clusters, basically. Uh, where you would try the uh, basic, the main idea is in some way uh, to, uh, to get more like a typology of uh, different shapes of change over the course of treatment. Uh, not only using initial information, but also using early, early information, early change over the course of treatment. Uh, so uh, I might should really switch already to the discussion where it was. Uh, 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 so I, I will summarize. This is that. How far are we at now with time? Is that? I think we have about seven minutes before we get into a general discussion. Oh, seven minutes. Okay. So I might say a few words after the study on this uh, early response thing, because there was and the yes, maybe sudden gains. So we also do like going more in detail on the discontinuous change and trying to define types of change, like patterns of change. You see this study uh, where we see uh, like early responding group, so less uh, less scores is better, uh, less symptoms, and you have like here uh, a group which has early response, and you have two groups don't change very much in the early of treatment, and as you can see, these change in terms of how they are. They are this one is continuous, this one is more discontinuous, and we study these groups more in detail, also videotapes and using this as predictors. And we find this actually also in the uh, NIMH study, but also in this TK study, this more stable groups early in treatment and this early responders. And they're very good in prediction, the results. Those doing early response, they very often have a good result at the end. And, uh, um, and then we look closer to this ups and downs and looking also to the videotapes before those sessions. And what you see here is, for example, uh, those having a gain and a loss between that phase. And we have like those having a loss, having the slowest effect sizes, but having gains and losses in the inventory of interpersonal problems. They have a lower effect size of chassis for initial scores uh, at the end of treatment. If they have a gain and loss during the course or this early course of treatment. And you see this, the, the early gains, that's or the Gainers is somehow a phenomenon of early change, but not all. You find them all over the course of treatment. 
uh, but the losses are very continuous over uh, um, over the. Um, oh, you want me to switch to a full screen? Uh, yeah. Okay. Losses are you find them all over the course of treatment. Uh, we study then also ruptures here uh, with the uh, and you see that in those. Let me sh before we get this in those gain sessions. Uh, uh, there are more uh, uh, resolutions of those ruptures are happening than in the loss sessions. Just uh, yeah, I, I, I might go directly now to the discussion, so I have to skip sure. the micro level. But uh, I think I uh, have here a few slides for this. Uh, what, what comes? What does this all mean for research and practice? Uh, Feedback and treatment progress or on the client or patient level seems to improve therapy, especially for those with an early negative development. Uh, but, but we do need more research on this and also on the implementation. What do therapists do with feedback? Uh, patients have a positive attitude to the evaluation of treatment. Uh, um, and we need more research on the cause of therapy. Uh, the goal would be somehow to come to a typology of change patterns, similar actually like we have typologies of psychopathology like the DSM. Uh, we, and we need to know the influential process factors on that. Uh, we have all kinds of new models are coming up, mixture modeling, uh, where we may be better able to model this uh, uh, these, um, change over time and the discontinuous change over time. And what else comes up? There are differences between therapists and those might be depending on patient's initial, initial impairment. Uh, Different treatment goals change with different rates in therapy. That's a phase model. I haven't talked too much on this. We have a group of early response, and it seems there are clients which are coming at the right time to the right place, and those respond very fast to therapy. There are probably other factors responsible for that than the specific treatment approach. Uh, and it seems also that we have patients which are able to profit from different treatment approaches. Uh, and also, subgroups of patients where differential patient progress seems to be happening uh, and depending on the treatment approach. So, therefore, some subgroups, maybe such specific treatment manuals or uh, work better and for others, maybe an extended, extended clinical program uh, with combined CBT with interpersonal approaches or experiential approaches. But we need further research on that. But that's basically uh, where we use these differential predictions based on that nearest neighbor so that we can actually do differential predictions. I guess I stop here and to open it now for, for discussion. Uh, sure. Thank Thanks you. very much, Wolfgang. That was a fascinating presentation. Uh, I'm sure that there's some questions uh, from the audience and given our time, uh, we'll uh, try to get right to those. Kim, do we have anybody on? Uh, yes, we do have one question that is from Danilo Moggia. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Danilo, go ahead. Hello? Yes, I hear you. Uh, could, could you talk something about the micro level? Uh, oh, okay. Uh, very shortly, uh, um, we used uh, uh, like a subclinical depressive subjects and healthy subjects, but now we do this kind of studies also within our outpatient center. And we did just a 60-minute session of positive reframing. A uh, student of mine, Louisa Zaunmüller, just finished her dissertation, and then uh, there's a new dissertation running from Sina Zahn and David Rosenbaum. And, uh, and we have um, also then divided this uh, where they got uh, positive reframing training of one hour and we have like a pseudo intervention group and uh, and the um, had then to look to the pictures of IAPS you see here an example picture uh, and then when they had an EEG on here you see parts of that training we had relation of emotions and cognitions and we had two film clips within that training so the basic idea is that we just try to test a micro intervention and to see if that makes a difference and show this change on a micro level, basically on the EEG, and it actually worked. Uh, as you can see here, this restructuring intervention uh, uh, had significant enhanced P3 amplitudes within the EEG, uh, and um, uh, you see this here in, in comparison to the other groups. Uh, 
so that was a really short cut on this. Uh, yeah, I'll let, I'll let this uh, transparency here. Yes, you see here on the. Uh, Hello? So I have more questions or? And, uh, no, and so this is just, I mean, yeah, this is a different focus. It's just a micro focus uh, compared to this macro and meso focus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Danilo, does this answer your question? Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so are there any other questions? Please your, raise your hand if you have a question. I see there's a question from Omar Gelo. Go ahead, Omar. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, I, I was uh, I saw a picture where you were comparing uh, a graph with continuous change and a graph with discontinuous change. Uh, okay. It was which one? Uh, 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 the one. Uh, wait. Uh, 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 uh. That one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. It, below, uh, it was uh, that one. Wait yeah. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. I, I was one. curious. How do you define? Yes. Um, I was wondering how you define discontinuous change. Oh, uh, within that, that's a growth mixture modeling approach. Within that study, uh, we defined basically those types, and then we looked and we and we 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 looked to those uh, uh, clusters of change basically. And uh, and then we look into those, and when you look into those clusters, you see the, you just see it. It's just by eyes that in this cluster, this is looks very discontinuous. And if you look to uh, what's happening in terms of predicting, like the rapid early response, they have 96% of reliable change at the end of treatment, and they have shorter treatments too. But for those continuous group, you have they don't change at the end too. Uh, those defined with growth mixture mods, but the discontinuous group, uh, that's the one who uh, is more heterogeneous, so they have no change or they have a positive change. Uh, so they have a more mixed outcome, basically, whereas this continuous group doesn't change at the end either. So, so it's basically the idea, and uh, we try to figure out if we find something similar in the NIMH data, and we did at least find those early responding groups and using different data sets in order to find those types of change and to see if that's really something meaningful that you find different patterns of change in different data sets. Uh, we use this here within the uh, this insurance company study but also using session reports to do this and we also try to figure out what's the difference so that's a study done by Katarina Kirk which I really like the BHQ uh, it's a cooperation with Mark Hopter, Steve Saunders, and Takuya Minami, where we have the BHQ data set, it's counseling centers all over the U.S., and with 5,484 clients uh, overall. And then we def look if those early positive change, this change pattern, is really something defined via those growth mixture model, is really something very different than the traditional defined reliable change or clinical significant change, which is just a pre-post model. And to see if that really makes a different group, and it looks, at least based on that, uh, uh, on that Venn diagram, you see it seems to be something different in terms of uh, uh, um, subs something different in, in compared to uh, traditional clinical significant definitions. Okay. Okay. So, so actually, you didn't give any a priori criteria to define to find out if this no, that we do is taking place. Yeah, we do this within the sudden gain and sudden loss okay. research okay. arena. So there we define this based on the criteria defined by Tang and the Ruby. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. yeah. And there we define, so there had been stability before the treatment, and then there have to be the sudden gain, or we, we applied this also to the sudden losses, and then there's stability after. And then to look mm -hmm. okay. what happens uh, basically then uh, and to look if they have patients, see for those having patients a gain or a loss during treatment or maybe a gain and a loss during the course of treatment and what does this mean for the end of treatment and in the next step we basically look to the videotapes uh, here what's, what's happening before that gain 
what are the reasons for that gain? It could be also like external events. Uh, and are they related maybe to alliance ruptures or specific techniques which have been used and so on? That's that's a study. Twenty-five page twenty-eight session, video tape session based on this data. As uh, it's a student of mine, Thorsten Ehrlich, is working on this. Yeah. Okay, so do we have some other questions? I see that Omar still has a short question. Okay, so is there anyone else who has a question for Dr. Lutz? No questions? Unmuted, says Oh, my yes. I, uh, <laughs> Catherine uh, am there. I gone or, huh? No, you're still here. Catherine, go ahead. Catherine? Well, thank you, Wolfgang, for this uh, wonderful... Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yes I, I hear you, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I want to raise a methodological issue, maybe. Uh, I think... Really what I can see also now in the quantitative world that there's for me really a paradigm shift in the last five to ten years that we don't only look at outcome uh, results and try to cluster outcome, but we zoom into the patterns of change. Yes. And that's something fairly new to me to see that in such a big scale quantitative study as you presented here. Because uh, usually I know it from the more qualitative world where we have a smaller sample size and then we yes. look at specific patterns of change. Yes. So now in, in the qualitative area, the way how we try to make our results of patterns of change more representable is by doing meta-analyses now. So we try to go to other published articles and to try to see what common types of patients we find. Yes. My yes. question for you is in your study, um, I'm sure that you have a lot of information on some samples uh, that would yeah. make it possible to go deeper. Are you planning to maybe look at some very typical clients or client clusters and yes. then do something more in depth? Like even yes. looking at the intercession yes. questionnaires and then doing a, a little bit more of a qualitative uh, um, Yes. Well, in, in some way, yeah. In somehow, I mean like the... Uh, uh, when we do the sudden gains research, uh, that's, I mean, we're actually doing two, uh, work in, in two areas uh, co close to, I think, what, what you're talking about. And the one is the sudden gain ar arena where we do the uh, video analysis. And we basically use the videotapes and use video rating systems. And we'll use several video rating systems and technologies which are also qualitative uh, to get on in depth onto the individual session where they are available. So we define basically on those more quantitative criteria. These are more like selection criteria for defining those samples, those subsamples where we do go more into depth on. Uh, that's for this research. So we will use the same sample and using several methods basically, uh, though that's at least the idea in the, for the longer term, several methods within those research. And then you uh, several new students coming in, like Marie Rötke, Nora Halbach, Christine Joras, who will work on this with different methods. And then we have um, also uh, 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 now a new follow-up study where we try from our clinic here, uh, try to get in touch with uh, after five years or six years or maybe ten years of the treatment. And then we will have an interview with those two, and we will do uh, look what the uh, also in basically when I look to the outcome quantitative outcome measures, I think there are still some percentage of patients where they don't cover too well. I would like to learn more about this 20 percent, 30 percent patients where the the outcome measure doesn't fit basically the clinical impression, because within our clinic uh, we do lots of indication, and I'm involved in the indication procedure. So what that means is that we have like a client comes into uh, uh, into the treatment, and then we have like a first the first session is done by an experienced therapist, and then they get videotaped, and we use this information for an indication decision, 
uh, we, we meet with the clinical team and then we make the decision based on, on the empirical data. It's basically what I showed you uh, um, uh, before at the beginning. So we have this information here uh, for the whole clinical team. So we have the videotape for the patient and we have this quantitative information. And then we try to, to think what the best treatment option and what the best trainee actually would be for that for that patient. Mm -hmm. So that's thank uh, you. the concept. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Wolfgang. We have another question by, uh, from Paula Danino. Paolo? Go, Paula, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Hi, you all. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking about maybe the same question as Catherine. Um, I'm also studying patterns of change in more a qualitative way, um, yes. but also I was thinking um, it would be because you have a very big sample and it's it, I, enviously a very big sample you, because I'm in South America, so that's so difficult to have. Um, and I was thinking that um, it would be also I, I can imagine you have studied also, but uh, important to look at the therapist. Um, trainee, maybe because uh, most of this sample, I don't know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, yeah. therapists maybe are in training, um, most of them, the ones that work in these um, sites with a lot of patients, you know, and yes. so that would, that would be one variable that I would be interested in um, to cross the therapist it. forever. Yeah, uh, yeah, I the, think the, it's... Um, yeah, I, I mean, we will. Yeah, we will. We will do some studies with it. I mean, we have we have done some some therapist differences, but uh, uh, I really, I mean, Mike Lambert uh, and John Okishi mm -hmm. do, do a wonderful study where they they actually define. They have a huge sample and they they look for those uh, really improving those therapists doing better than than others, and then they yeah. they they try to do videotapes of those and try to study what's actually different. What do they different? Uh, I like that. Uh, uh, what we are can look here is also we have some information on uh, based on those health insurance where we have like uh, how much experience they have and because uh, it's not not all that's the data I present is very mixed bag actually of different data sets from different countries and in some we have some therapist information and uh, we have also like uh, uh, within that large large health insurance data set we have just finished uh, well actually I, I was uh, I I, could, I, I was thinking going just talking just about that uh, study because it's just right now in the media in Germany and I have next week a presentation in Berlin uh, where there are also some politicians uh, around where they talk about uh, about the how, how the, the future of psychotherapy and and um, but I didn't want I wanted to show you the whole perspective also the training uh, yeah. sample and the different options connected to that yeah yeah. And um, can I, I, I have been in Heidelberg and my experience there was that they use a lot uh, the OPD. I think it's for this, what you told about this um, uh, training for the insurance, to give to the insurance the yes. report. Yeah? yeah, feedback, yes. Um, yeah, and I, I don't know if that's uh, usual in all, high, in all Germany or Switzerland and um just looking well there was just a pilot yeah. study actually it's not no it's not okay. usual it's just a pilot study ah, okay. Yeah. okay and and it, yeah. but it's usually within our training program so we mm -hmm. have this focus uh on on individual patient change and, and outcomes too and within our training clinic and uh, but it's a big debate uh within the whole service system in germany mm -hmm. um uh, how, how much of this should be or could be implemented in, uh, for this review yeah. system they have for the continuation or the beginning of treatment, but how this comes out at the end isn't clear yet. So, but yeah. many, many in many hospitals or in many inpatient settings, but also in many outpatient centers and training programs, uh, some feedback is already uh, it's often used. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you, Paula. Um, we have a final question by Omar Gero. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I was uh, trying to get to understand uh, the difference between the meso, uh, the meso and the micro level. 
and uh, does it have to do somehow with the um, with the uh, time, uh, how do you say, how, with the time scale at which you assess the data, as, as long as, as I understood, I, I have the feeling that with the, within the MISO level, you usually have post-session measures, whether cross yes. or outcome, yeah. or in the well, micro, or the, or or the, in the level, level I mean, you have. Yeah. Well, we will have two, of course, uh, studies in the future where we mix those levels. I mean, it's just a very rough orientation right now for myself and also for uh, for, for uh, different people involved, but uh, uh, but the the main difference basically is on the meso level we do based on session reports, uh, measurements on each session and videotapes, and on the micro level we use EEG and we have like just a micro intervention, just one session. It's not part of the regular treatment. It can be done during the waiting list or or basically it's done right now during the waiting time when patients applied for treatment, but they have at least very often they have to wait a couple of months before they can get into the clinic and uh, then we, we ask them if they want to participate to this micro-intervention study uh, right now and um, so we, we focus uh, at that and then we give them one hour session to, just to use one technique. Basically the idea is, is it possible to show the, the impact of, of one in psychological intervention, one technique used you know, all, you all know that it's not so easy in our field to show differences. Uh, there are different techniques; they make a difference to others, or are they all the same? Uh, it's, a, it's a big old debate, actually. And uh, uh, so we try to see if we find a difference in terms of those uh, different techniques on that micro level, uh, and, and if it could be shown on the EEG level. And we have some promising results. Uh, uh, and we'll continue with this. Yes? Okay. Well, thank you, Wolfgang. I think uh, we're now at the end of the time that we have uh, available for this. Um, so I would like to uh, thank you and John both for um, you for your um, very interesting presentation, obviously. Uh, and John, thank you for being a moderator for us. Um, I'm now I have now launched the final poll for the um, uh, for the webinar, and please, uh, if everybody in the audience can vote um, how well they like this uh, webinar and how close, how well did it match your own research interest, that is very useful for us um, to uh, be able to organize future webinars. And um, let's see what else is coming in. Um, if we have any open questions? No? Okay, so uh, I just want to say thank you all for attending this webinar. Uh, we're now at the end. Let me remind you again, the next webinar is November 22 um, at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and it's going to be Ken Levy, uh, and he's going to present on career perspectives. So uh, thank you all very much for attending, and we will now um, close down this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Tua. Thank you all for attending.